Hopefully, tonight's conversation is being recorded. It will be available to rewatch and to share with others later. All right. The Movement That Never Was, A People's Guide to Anti-Racism in the South and Arkansas, is a five-part podcast series. It's written and executive produced by our first panelist this evening, Paul Kiefer, supported by the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation. The series explores past anti-racism movements in the South and in Arkansas, their intersections with working class movements, political and economic systems, particularly the participation of white communities in the movements. This is all in the hope of finding a new way forward. First two episodes of the podcast are available at KUAF.com. And the second episode of the podcast will be airing on 91.3 FM and KUAF.com immediately following this discussion. All right, let's meet our panelists for this conversation. I mentioned Paul. He's a graduate of Pomona College, a freelance journalist based in Seattle. He wrote and executed, uh, executive produced the podcast. He was an intern with Durham, North Carolina Public Radio Station W. UNC on their local daily news magazine, The State of Things. He was a finalist for NPR's Kroc Fellowship. Stephanie Isaacs is an affordable housing activist and founder of the Bedford County Listening Project and newly elected city council member in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Hi Thurman is a founding member of the Young Patriots Organization, member of the Rainbow Coalition, an anti-racist teacher. His autobiography of a life spent on the front lines of the struggle, Revolutionary Hillbilly, comes out in December. And Michael Pierce is an associate professor of history at the University of Arkansas. His current project looks at race and the labor movement in post-war Arkansas with a particular emphasis on Little Rock's central high crisis. Good evening, I'm Kyle Kellums, KUAF News Director, host of Ozarks at Large. I'll be moderating this conversation again. Use the chat feed. I'm a radio guy, I forget there's a camera. Please use the chat feature. Uh, as this evening and conversation goes on. Paul, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, just a, a brief summary for those who haven't heard the second episode, which was on earlier today, but perhaps they didn't have a chance. So I'd like you to just kind of give a summary of what was in the second one, and then we're going to go to Michael. Right. So if you remember the first episode, we kind of began with a, a critique of white involvement in SNCC's Freedom Summer um, and kind of aftermath of Freedom Summer in um, 1964 and you know late late 60s. Uh, and after that, you wind up with a, a handful of white SNCC volunteers who try to get involved in the realm of um, working class solidarity uh, organizing, essentially wor building working class solidarity for the sake of anti-racist organizing in the South. Um, but those brief attempts by SNCC organizers um, died out, you know, fairly quickly within, you know, one or two years of their inception. But that world of, of, of uh, multiracial working class solidarity uh, is a very well established track within the anti-racist movement in the South that dates back centuries. It's, you know, pretty much the first anti-racist movements to exist in North America. Uh, and so we wanted to, you know, track a handful of examples of that kind of track of, of that kind of world within the anti-racist movement um, after the 1960s or in the in the 1960s and onwards. So we um, made a direct connection to SNCC through in, in the form of the Southern Students Organizing Committee, which which did some more lasting kind of union organizing in the South. Um, and many of its members were had worked with SNCC um, in the early 60s. And then we jumped to Chicago in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, where, with the Young Patriots organization that was tied into um, a pretty broad multiracial coalition known as the Rainbow Coalition. Um, and then we jumped to the, to the present um, in the form of a tenants' rights movement in Shelbyville, Tennessee, organized by Stephanie Isaacs, among other people, and Kelly Waller is here as well. And uh, she is another organizer with the Bedford County Listening Project. Um, and the kind of culmination thus far of, of uh, that movement has been the election of, of Stephanie to Shelbyville City Council, not the culmination, but like that is the, the new development. Um, so culmination is the wrong word, but the newest development is 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 um, Stephanie's election to City Council. So we, that's the whole run of the episode. Um, but the core theme is, you know, why is uh, multiracial working class solidarity such a, a vital element of, of white anti-racist organizing historically and why does it what are the roadblocks to it why has it sort of faltered in the past um so we'll get to that tonight thank you paul and kelly i apologize for not introducing you there it wasn't on my script but kelly is uh, from shelbyville and is uh, an organizer and with the bedford listening project as well michael pierce is with us uh from fayetteville and 
Now, we didn't hear Michael in episode two, but there we will, correct, Paul? Yes, in, uh, we will hear him in episode three. Uh, well, I want we to start the conversation. To, use him as, to connect working class solidarity to this, the next subject. So you will hear from him. All right, we're going to hear from him now, uh, Michael, a little bit about what your work and your research is when it comes to, to labor movements and race. Yeah, one of the things I look at, or the big thing I look at, is the real, this um, black labor um, liberal political alliance that that emerged um, in Arkansas uh, during World War II, and continued and, and remained extremely effective through uh, the mid 1970s. And you know, as, as a way to 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 introduce this. Um, um, in the 1960s, the, the most um, prominent, the most active uh, African-American civil rights leader in the state was a guy named Ozell Sutton. And in the 19, late 1980s, uh, Ozell Sutton gave a, a series of, of oral history interviews. Um, and, and this is what he said. And he, 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 he was older at the time, and he was looking back and kind of shocked gobsmacked the, the, about the changes that he had witnessed in his life from World War II up until the 1970s, late 70s. But it, and then he was kind of remorseful uh, that things got to the 70s and kind of stopped or deteriorated. And, and this is what he said. And, and I guess this is the 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 the, the scripture I want to explain. And, and, and Sutton said, um, it was the coming together uh, of liberals and blacks and unions in the 1940s and 50s that really brought the change that was made in this city, Little Rock, and the state. And for him, the most prominent African American activist in Arkansas in the 1960s, he's saying it's coalition building. It is white working class people. Uh, it is African American leaders. And it is these liberals. By the way, the liberals he's talking about are mainly um, labor lawyers who take a, a prominent political role. And what held this coalition together was not what we now call anti-racism. It was economic solidarity among working people. You can call it New Deal style liberalism, but this coalition between liberals and blacks and unions was built around worker protections, minimum wage laws, maximum hour laws, um, an expanded robust bust welfare state that took care of the neediest people. It was um, built around demands to expand public education for everybody. And, and this coalition came together um, during World War um, II. Um, and Blacks and African Americans and liberals were protesting in Arkansas elite control. Um, the state had a poll tax. The elite used the poll tax to keep poor people, working class people, from voting. Um, low levels, working class whites, working class blacks, poor blacks, poor bl whites, never had enough money to pay for a poll tax to be able to vote. And, and, and so this made African Americans and working class whites allies. They needed to come together to, to overthrow the power of the planters, the bankers, the utility magnets that ran the state. And, and this really, really st started to kick off in 1948. With, um, uh, uh, 1948 was the first year that large numbers of African Americans, significant numbers of African Americans, could cast free ballots in the state. And that year, African Americans and labor came together to elect a guy named Sidney McMath to the governor's office. They defeated the Dixiecrat, the anti-labor, anti-black gubernatorial candidate. 
Sidney McMath was only able to win because of the black vote. His Dixiecrat opponent actually won the white vote. And it was the 90% black vote that he got that put him over the top, the margin of victory. And ever since that election, organized labor in the state of Arkansas saw the black vote as critical to electing liberal politicians. And they started to encourage black voting. Um, most famously, in, in 1953, um, organized labor sent some or, um, political organizers into the state to organize the, to help African Americans get out the vote. Um, these CIO black organizers. Um, taught uh, Ozell Sutton, Wiley Brandt, and all of these black activists how to mobilize black voters. And the CIO and the American Federation of Labor actually sent thousands of dollars into the state to buy poll tax receipts for African American voters. And the idea here is you know this is this is mostly white trade unionists spending money to get black people to the polls this was about empowering african americans politically as part of an effort to help working class people poor people regardless of race and this continues. Um, in 1955, uh, organizers uh, come back and they pay for more poll taxes. But, and, um, and, but this year, in 1956, they want, um, organized labor puts a, a, an amendment to abolish the poll tax um, on the ballot through the initiative process. Um, th organized labor is at the forefront of trying to achieve black voting rights. That in 1956, it falls flat. It's, it's caught up in the central high crisis, uh, school integration. But they come back, and and this is this is where I think it, Paul wants me to go. In um, 1964, in, in January of 1964, uh, the 24th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is ratified. That bans um, the requirement of a poll tax to vote in a federal election. Arkansas responds to this by separating their state and local elections from the federal elections and taking Alabama's voting law and putting on the books in Arkansas. The Arkansas AFL-CIO, black uh, civil rights groups come together and they form a coalition to put a constitutional amendment abolishing the poll tax, creating a permanent registration system on the ballot, very transparent. This is where organized labor, SNCC, other civil rights groups are coming together. Um, I, I talked to the director of Arkansas, SNCC, about this process. And he says, look, the white labor leaders are are the only pe white people in Arkansas who understood what we needed to do and what we had to do and what civil rights movement was all about. And so it's this black labor political coalition that got the poll tax removed in 1964 through the initiative process. Bank labor bankrolled the campaign. And this opens up Arkansas politics to working class people for the first time. You know, and, and one of the statistics I use is um, between 1948 and 1968, Arkansas's population remained the same. The number of voters tripled. And that was getting working class folk, white and black, and um, increasingly um, Latino people to the polls. And that created the, what we in Arkansas call the, these liberal, the liberal heyday of the early 1970s. Uh, progressive taxes, um, reform of banks and utilities, opening up. And this is when, this is what Ozell Sutton means by the achievements. Um, and um, in the 1970s, ACORN came involved with 
this. And it was ACORN, Arkansas Community Organizations for Reform Now, started in Little Rock before moving outward. Labor, ACORN, black groups, and that made Arkansas the most liberal state in the nation, or I'm sorry, in the South in the 1970s. We were an outlier. And so I guess I, I probably took up too much time, but. Um, but what we'll get to at the end is, is then why that fell apart. Cause you know, th that, that'll be the kind of crucial next step but we'll, we'll get towards, we'll get to that eventually. No, yeah, I, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but, but yeah, but we're gonna do that. Thank you, Michael. For those of you who've just joined us, um, we're talking about the second episode of, of the podcast, uh, The Movement That Never Was. Our next um, panelist is Hi Thurman, who um, has a history and is contemporarily working in anti-racism circles. It's taking him from Tennessee to Chicago. He is joining us from uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Hi, thank you very much. And it's not really fair to ask you in eight or 10 minutes to summarize the work you have done, but yet that's what I'm going to ask you to try to do. Uh, hi, you're muted. Yeah, I've been that. I've been muted quite often. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's such an honor. I, en I always enjoy talking to people and, you know, uh, spreading the gospel of anti-racism because it really is a gospel when we get down to it. Um, I am from East Tennessee. Uh, I was a part of a migrant uh, merge of people that went to Chicago uh, to find a better job uh, because of the, well, I guess because of the mines being closed down and the textile mills and the um, uh, just harsh living conditions uh, people moved to, a lot of Southern people moved to Chicago, uh, Detroit, Cincinnati, uh, uh, Philadelphia, other places to find jobs. And um, I, I went there in 1967, but there were some, some organizing going on before I got there. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Young Patriot Organization uh, was an organization that uh, mostly Southern white teenagers, migrants. And what we tried to do was to solve the problems, the poor, uh, mostly white residents within the community because it was, it was mostly a white, white community at the time, very few blacks, but it was a racially mixed uh, uh, community. Uh, we were facing a lot of poverty within the community and police brutality and murders, false arrest, unemployment, uh, women being raped by the cops. Uh, there was uh, arson, class hatred, uh, hunger, lack of health care, a high infant mortality rate within the community, high rate of disease of black lung and brown lung and uh, you know, tuberculosis, uh, and all these uh, affected the daily lives of the people that live there. Uh, but the young patriots can be tracked all the way back to post-World War II, um, uh, coming into Chicago. Uptown itself was created as a community, which was an entertainment community for Chicago. It was a diamond, it was a jewel of, of uh, entertainment until uh, there was an exodus to the suburbs. Uh, it was the Hollywood at one time, uh, made movies and it moved, they moved to uh, Hollywood and other parts of California, which left a lot of vacancies. And, and so they couldn't fill those vacancies, uh, the apartments, so they cut them up into small efficiency apartments and would start renting them out to just anyone uh, you can you could buy you know you could rent them for the the week or the month so it, it deteriorated the community did uh, but 
the young patriots uh, can be traced all the way back to post-World War II uh, to a gang called the Peacemakers. Uh, the Peacemakers are made up of mostly Southern whites, uh, you know, doing their gang banging stuff that gangs usually do. Uh, but it wasn't until 19, around 1966, when uh, the Students for a Democratic Society moved into the community to help find people jobs. And um, they found out that there were more problems than just jobs within the community, those that I just mentioned. So they started organizing with some of the, the local uh, youth and uh, the peacemakers was one of them. And so the peacemakers somewhat changed uh, and became political, much like the Young Lords organization did and uh, Hispanics within the Lincoln Park community and uh, started uh, organizing. The first thing he did was to organize a march on the police station because of police brutality. Several members had been murdered, um, you know, women being raped, all kinds of just atrocities coming down from the police because Mayor Richard J. Daley uh, ran his town uh, and his police department was a gang. He came up through the streets. He came, you know, basically through a gang. But he, uh, he hated poor people, he hated people of color, and he was only interested in the Irish, which pretty well controlled the city. And, and so he kept the city segregated. Uh, every, you know, everybody was in their own community and they were not allowed really to, to live in any other community. And if someone like, like a black person were to come and live in Uptown, it was, it was shunned. And there were a few, very few black people living in, in the uptown community. And there was a lot of racism within the community at the time. But uh, uh, later on, uh, after the police raid, I mean, after the police march, several of our members were murdered. Uh, and we knew that we had to kind of stick together as a, as a group of people. And uh, we were recognized uh, by the, the Black Panthers back in, in 1967 because of that. And uh, we were approached by the uh, Peace and Freedom Party ticket in uh, California. They were running Eldridge Cleaver as president and they wanted someone to run as vice president. So they came to the Uptown community and chose a woman named Peggy Terry who uh, was a former Klan member herself, uh, became an organizer. She was involved in SNCC. Uh, and so she was, she was just a hell of an organizer, a great person. So they chose her to run as her, as the vice president. And, uh, and so we, as I came along in 1967, you know, as a, uh, just a, a very green <laughs> person from the South. Uh, looking for a job. My brother was there. As a matter of fact, he was one of the leaders of the peacemakers, uh, had turned political. So they started, this is where I started learning my political ideology, uh, was from them and from the uh, Students for a Democratic Society. And so um, we ran as a group of youth, uh, a presidential campaign. You know, and you must, I must admit that we were so young that we didn't have a clue as to what we were doing, but we knew that we were going to try to make some kind of a change within the community. Uh, and so we did run that campaign uh, running against George Wallace. Uh, and, you know, of course, we didn't we didn't win. The, we didn't win the election, but we did uh, prove that people could work together. And so that kind of started chipping away at Mayor Daley's segregation, um, which really pissed him off. We, we from there, renamed ourselves uh, the Goodfellas, which, you know, associated, you know, the name was associated with the mafia at that point. So eventually we had to change it. But we started working within the community. And just by uh, just pure luck. Uh, we went to a community meeting in the Lakeview community made up of mostly white liber uh, liberals 
uh, a group that they would bring in once a week and once a month, I should say, and uh, have presentations about what was going on in Chicago. We did not know that the Black Panthers were going to be there. They did not know that we were going to be there. Uh, we showed up with our uh, Confederate flag on our berets and on our and on our uh, jackets, and uh, really got the third degree from this group. And and uh, Bobby Lee, one of the Black Panthers, stood up and defended us. And so that is where we started making contact with with the Black Panthers and trying to develop programs. Now, we were all pretty much raised in an environment where we were racist. Uh, we were fighting racism uh, and learned a lot from the Black Panthers. They had a, a 10 point program. We devised an 11 point program. We devised our 10 point program from them and started working within the community, uh, which brought in uh, Mayor Richard Daly uh, was, was uh, not one to let anybody get any power. Uh, because we at that time had made some alliances with the Black Panthers and with the um, uh, Young Lords. Uh, and he brought in J. Edgar Hoover from the FBI. We were starting to set up our, uh, you know, our, our free health clinics, uh, food pantries, and everywhere we would go, uh, the, the, the cops would go in and talk to the landlords and kick us out. Uh, most of us were on a steady occasion being arrested, uh, Cha-Cha Jimenez of the Young Lords, he had 18 counts on him at one time, uh, all false arrests. And uh, we were, we said, uh, anytime we wanted to get in touch with Cha-Cha, we'd just call the county jail, we could find him. But it was a brutal existence for, for a lot of people because uh, the, the cops uh, that were in the community were, were psychotic. Uh, Mayor Daly chose the undesirables and the uh, psychotic cops to patrol those poor neighborhoods, you know, no matter what color. And they tried to keep everybody in line. So uh, they were known just to, just to beat people uh, at random. Uh, and so we were a number one target, of course, we became a target. Uh, with Mayor Daly and uh, the with J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, Mayor Daly and his police, I, you know, I, I remember them coming into my apartment all the time. I just never knew when they were coming. And at one, one time, um, they knocked on the door and I said, who's there? And they said, it's the uh, police. And I said, uh, what do you want? And they just put a key in the door and came in. You know, managed to start roughing up everybody in the apartment. Uh, I was uh, taken into an alley, uh, beaten, laying there in my piss and shit and vomit and everything else, you know, and they just didn't care. Uh, and they, the, uh, the cops had a, had a safe house within the community that if, if, uh, someone got into some type of trouble or they could falsify their troubles, their crimes. And they had a, a, a good looking wife or sister. They would try to make arrangements to have sex with, with them uh, to keep their relatives out of jail. Uh, and and the, the highest ranking one that I knew of that would do that was a police lieutenant. The, uh, the police department in that area in Uptown was busted in 1959 by the, by the FBI. Uh, a detective had caught a burglar and uh, uh, instead of arresting him, he became the cop's uh, private personal burglar. And so as they would catch people doing crimes or, or trumped up crimes, they would, they would make them their burglar. And it's pretty much that, pretty much the whole district at that point had a, had a burglar that uh, if they needed to have some type of a cookout, somebody have to go out and steal the steak. If they need a golf club, somebody have to go out and steal that. 
uh, just all kinds of items. And then um, there was a, a detective not knowing anything about this from another division busted one of the burglars and he started he started telling the story. And so that was called the Great Somerdale Scandal. And that uh, eight, I think eight cops went to jail on that one and the police commissioner for the city was fired and they brought in O.W. Wilson to, to reorganize the police. Uh, but once he left, uh, it went back to business as usual. Uh, they, they, you know, continued their, uh, their brutal beatings and murders. Um, we have, uh, I have a picture on the wall back here of John Howard. If you saw him, if you saw our documentary, uh, he was in there and he was saying that we should take these landlords and throw them out in the lake somewhere and uh, if he'll stick with the Panthers if they'll stick with us. And uh, he went to Georgia on a vacation. Uh, somebody in a uh, in a, a restaurant saw him and said, there's that nigger lover from Chicago. And so a couple of days later, he was found with his throat cut. Uh, we had another Can member. Do you that, talk about some of this? I'm sorry? Do you talk about some of this? Do you talk about some of this in, in the book that will yes. be coming out next month? Yeah, it's in there. All right. I want to ask you. All right. I want to ask you more about that mm -hmm. in, in just a bit. I want to bring in. Uh, thank you. For that. I want to bring in Stephanie Isaacs and Kelly Sue Waller, who are with um, the uh, Bedford County Listening Project. Stephanie has just been elected to okay. the uh, council council in Shelbyville, Tennessee, and I'm, I'm interested to hear about the Listening Project, what that is, and how and if that was a springboard to your candidacy and ultimate election. Yeah, so kind of what started it back in 2017, there was a Unite the Right rally here in Shelbyville. Um, so we had a counter protest for it. Um, there were like, I remember there's like a school in front of my house. There were snipers on top of the roof to get there. To, you had to get patted down to go counter protest. But um, the thing that like stuck out to me the most was that the people on the right like they they thought everybody should have health care and stuff. They were basically talking like Bernie Sanders, but they just thought black folks shouldn't have it. And that's what got me thinking is like the right is always organizing. The right is always reaching out to people and folks aren't necessarily racist. They just want to feed their families. So we started door knocking in Shelbyville because we wanted to see what people were like facing, what was going on, what like we didn't want those folks to come back. So, you know, we start door knocking. People are struggling. There's a lot of poverty in Shelbyville. There's a lot going on in Shelbyville. And housing was the biggest thing, substandard housing. There's no protections here for people. Um, so that's how the Bedford County Listening Project was born. We did a housing survey. Um, here recently, we did like a visual for people that were being evicted because of COVID. Um, and within like all the door knocking and all the getting to know people, that's kind of what led to me um, running for office. The city council here in Shelbyville didn't want any part in it. We tried to pass Uralta countywide and all of the city or the county commissioners besides two said no. And these were Republican and Democrats. Um, <laughs> there's just nobody wanted to do anything about it. So that is why I ran for city council um, a lot of people like already knew who I was when I, I door knocked during a pandemic, <laughs> people knew who I was. Um, one of the things that kind of inspired me about like community building, um, my granny lives at this apartment complex, um, in another town and she kind of lives in the center of this apartment complex and everybody like comes to my granny's house to talk and to you know, come together, people of all colors, people of all religions, just everybody, and they all help each other, and they all, like, work together, and, you know, that's what I wanted for Shelbyville, um, 
another thing that was kind of happening was working class people are kind of ignored in the movement. Um, I lived in Shelbyville. I'm a single mom. I have two kids. There were no spaces for me in the movement. And I wanted there to be spaces for people, for working class folks, um, you know, to be able to come. And we had childcare. We had things for them to eat. We, you know, we were like, bring your kids, bring, just come show up. Um, some of the bigger issues we noticed, um, some of the landlords here were telling people they had bed bugs because of their black and brown neighbors. And so that was a conversation we had, like, why do you, like, it's not anybody, the landlord is the person with the power that's making all the money. What does your neighbors get out of that? Nothing when it comes down to it is that we all have to work together. So nobody has bed bugs. Um, during my campaign, you know, all this election stuff was going on. Um, people were leaving like um, KKK or like business cards on Joe Biden signs. So we had an anti-Klan rally <laughs> in the middle of all this and um, people showed up and came together. We were, there were a couple of people that showed up to protest it, but our message was, if you showed up to this rally, that meant you supported, you know, you did not support the KKK and you were anti-racist. And that, we just kept that message clear. Everybody is anti-racist. Our neighbors are important no matter what color we are. That's also a message we try to like expand on in the listening project is like when George Floyd death happened we made a post and we were like everybody deserves to feel safe in their home um there was like an anti-immigrant bill that was trying to pass that a lot of our working class folks you know showed up to like protest and say no my neighbors matter no matter where they're from who they are um let's see kelly do you want to speak some more on that hey um, I think you covered most of it. I think that Stephanie was just talking about how this this group of renters decided after spending the whole day doing press releases and talking to the press and having this um, a, a press conference in front of City Hall to talk about the egregious rental renter issues because the city asked as Stephanie mentioned, she ran for office because the city council wouldn't answer our emails, wouldn't answer anything about any of these issues, just completely ignored what was going on, had decided we were doing this press conference. And that was at like 8 a.m. And then the meeting was at like 9 p.m. where they were voting on this kind of anti-refugee non-binding resolution saying that Bedford County wouldn't take any more and um, refugees in, that those same folks, um, we're like, yes, let's go to that meeting and, and say, this is wrong. We, we, we like our neighbors. They made signs that were like, no slumlords, yes to refugees. Um, refugees, not slumlords, that's what it was. Um, for me, like Stephanie mentioned about having a place in the movement, like, I know that there's been a, a hard history of working class solidarity but it gives me hope that once again, people like me who grew up in like trailer parks across the South and come from families where yes, I heard racist stuff, but I also had members of my family who were not racist, that we are trying to create a space for the people that are looking to the left and looking for their place to join. And like Stephanie mentioned, don't see it in a lot of those other spaces. They, they don't see like working class solidarity um, as a way to be anti-racist. So that's one of the things that we really want in Shelbyville is to find the folks that are looking for us. Because you know, the South gets written off a lot and poor white folks get written off a lot as automatically being ignorant or being racist. And yes, they are racist people in every demographic, but I think it's unfair to to lay the blame at the feet of poor white people constantly. And I think that, yeah, despite the troublesome history, which is true, <laughs> I, I, I want to continue doing this work. I want to continue bringing my people into a movement 
that is both about their own self-worth because yes, poor white people also deserve <laughs> that not to live in part poverty, not to live under oppressive governments, not to have these things happen to them. And the only way we're gonna get that is through working class solidarity with brown, black, queer, fat, LBG, all the things, the only way we're gonna get that. So it's really important to me um, in the other work that I do as part of Southern Crossroads, which BCLP is related to that project. You can find us on the internet somewhere. Um, Southern Crossroads across the region, providing a place for people who want to join the movement, but they haven't been reached out to because they look and they don't see themselves in a lot of these liberal spaces. They don't see people like them. And they don't know all this language. Like I didn't, I didn't know any of those words. Um, and I, I love the fact that we are trying to create a space that anyone can come in and do the kind of radical welcome we're talking about and let people as they struggle together change. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to remind our uh, those of you who have joined us that there is a chat feature. You can ask questions. We've got a lot of good ones already. And I want the second half of this to not just be me asking one or two people questions directly, I wanna get a conversation started. And a theme that we have heard here is the need or, or, or the growing theme that I think I've heard is the organization, right? Paul, it's actually, there's a quote in the second episode of the podcast of the movement that never was, getting people together about the bad pipes, about the bed bugs, something that we have in common. And Kelly, you, you touched on that and I'm wondering, we know how important it is, but are there success stories? Are there reasons to believe that some sort of broad coalition can come together through shared uh, concerns about fair housing, through fair labor, that can work in an anti-racist manner? So two-part. Are there success and, stories we can go to? Is there hope that that will advance? Paul? And if I could add to that, something that's lasting, that isn't, that isn't single issue, but that, that actually has legs to it beyond, you know, a, a piece of legislation or, or, you know, a particular candidate. So I'm going to open that up to the rest of the panel there. Any success stories <laughs> that we can look to? Any reason to think that some sort of broad lasting coalition can develop? Um, Stephanie, when we were doing our anti-Klan rally. Um, we were, <laughs> we had like an art night the night before. And I mean, you know, our, like the Bedford County Listening Project is, you know, nonpartisan. Okay. So I had people that probably believe in the QAnon like stuff, help me paint a Shelbyville says no to the KKK. So I, I feel like there's, you know, I, there's people in our group that might have voted for Trump, but they thought that Breonna Taylor's death was unjust. Like there's, there's movement happening. People are, you know, baby steps, but it's happening. I think one way to approach this, this topic is, you know, I think Stephanie and, and Kelly are involved in something that's ongoing and so is High certainly, but also both High and Michael have some knowledge about why things didn't survive. I mean, what happened, you know, after years of police harassment to the, uh, to the young patriots and what happened to the labor and, uh, you know, kind of the, the working class, white working class, black solidarity in Arkansas that prevented lasting, um, kind of lasting movement of politics. Um, and that might give us some idea of, of, of sort of what, what obstacles there are to overcome before that, you know, that eventuality is, is, uh, is, is tenable. Well, one, one of the reasons that, well, well first of all, the, the, the Rainbow Coalition has lived on uh, and we're, we're doing work in across the country and we're doing work in, in uh, Huntsville right now with the North Alabama School for Organizers uh, in teaching people to organize or teaching people to refine their skills and uh, uh, talking and, and, and working uh, against racism uh, and imperialism. Uh, but one of, the, one of the reasons that the young patriots and we've we've revived 
some of the chapters uh, around the country occasionally. But one of the reasons that the Young Patriots, the Young Lords, and, and to some extent the Black Panthers, uh, you know, didn't, didn't really endure into the public after the assassination, let's say, of Fred Hampton, uh, was because of the relentless attacks by the COINTELPRO and uh, the, the police department. And I think I, I was touching on some of that a while ago about one of our members that was killed. Uh, we had several members killed, but this was, uh, this person had been tracked and, and most of us had been tracked everywhere we went to. Uh, that the local police uh, would know were there. Okay, so they weren't about to give up on uh, destroying the movement. And that's exactly what they were trying to do is destroy the movement. And a lot of people become, uh, well, they get, they get afraid of that type of thing. Uh, we had numbers that, that would have continued, it's just that for their own safety, they dropped out of the movement. Uh, and then, of course, you get, you get uh, just times change. You know, they're not the same as they were then. Now there's whole different types of communications going on. I don't see any leaders really within, within the, the country now. Uh, I see so many splits going on. Uh, people being complacent and uh, and people not really knowing what they need, what they want to do. And I think some of that comes from uh, maybe some of the organizers themselves not understanding the different roles of organizing. And, and there's you know there's a lot of different roles. People get in different roles and uh, and, and should belong in, in another one. For instance, uh, what we do in the North Alabama School for Organizers, um, and I think to some extent, Southern Crossroads, we've talked about it, and some of the other organizations, um, people forget what their values are, you know, and everybody needs to understand a value that they have, be it an organization or an individual. But for an organizer, the organizer needs to understand the role of what they're doing. Now, there's all kinds of different roles. So we had, uh, for instance, um, went through 16 to 18 different roles of an organizer. And, and two thirds of the people in the class thought that they were in the wrong role. So there's not a lot of education going on. And we see a need for a lot of education you know, in the movement to keep the movement going. The movement's going, it never stopped. It's just going in all different directions. And, uh, and so I, I think with, with what Southern Crossroads are doing and Black uh, Rednecks for Black Lives and those organizations, I, I think they're on the right track because they're reaching people and they're trying to listen to people and, and they meet the people from where they're at. And I think a lot of problems that we have these days is people wanna change people to where they think they should be and then meet them there. So I think uh, it, being a, a Trump supporter or, you know, or whoever it is, we have to understand exactly where they're coming from before we can you know, do any type of organizing and uh, that's, that's the way that I see, um, that's a lot of what's keeping us from being a national movement. Only my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you, hi. M Michael, looked like you were saying something. Yeah, I think you're, you're muted there, Michael. That's all right. Okay, uh, yeah, I want to jump in here um, and, and add something. Um, just uh, two days ago, um, or yesterday on, on the 18th, the uh, 
general accounting office, the GAO, the, the, the government's accountants, accountants um, issued a report about SNAP benefits. Um, and, and one of the things that has become apparent is that um, in nine states, uh, Walmart has 14,541 employees on SNAP benefits. Walmart, the Walton family since the start of the pandemic has accumulated an extra $63 billion in wealth. Poverty, pitting working class people against each other is very, very profitable for powerful people in our country. Um, you know, and, and, and Paul asked about, you know, what happened um, in the 1970s um, in Arkansas. How does Arkansas go from the most liberal state in the South to um, what it is today? And um, if you look at the liberalism that, that, that um, that, that merged in the 1970s in, in Arkansas, um, the election of Dale Bumpers in, in 1970. Um, bumpers came in, took labor black political agenda and enacted it, said that the way to create prosperity in Arkansas is to make sure that working people have money in their pockets. Um, but Dale Bumpers um, underwent a change once he was in office. He changed his political calculus. It becomes easier to stay in office by um, cozying up to um, wealthy people to provide, you know, and, and, and so, so what, what David Pryor did, what Bill Clinton did, what um, Dale Bumpers do in the 1970s, these are men who were elected by this black, labor acorn coalition um, once they're in office they jump out of bed and with labor and they're, they're getting into bed with um, Sam Walton and the Tysons and the Stevens and and and, and when labor and and black working people go to these politicians for help they talk about austerity deregulation, tax cuts. Dale Bumpers was, was a, an economic liberal in 1970 when he was elected. By 1980, he says, I am an economic conservative and a social liberal. And, and, and what that does, what that does is um, the type of labor organizing, the type of working class organizing um, becomes much more difficult. Um, organized labor asked for reforms, the, the Labor Reform Bill of 1977 and 1978. And, and, and in order to stress their bona fides with corporate Arkansas, Dale Bumpers and David Pryor and Bill Clinton had to side with the Waltons and the Tysons. And, and, and what this, this third wave democratic movement, this DLC that Bill Clinton and Pryor and, and Bumpers are part of, that was not an economic strategy. That was an electoral strategy on their part. And, and, and so what you see after the mid 70s is um, corporations like Walmart, corporations like Tyson Foods become more um, strident in their efforts to prevent union organizing. They adopt new techniques, they fire organizers knowing that's a violation of the law, but they are willing to, to pay a small fine in order to keep unions at bay. And, and, and the unions, I think, are important in all of this because up until the, the Reagan years, unions had a legal standing 
and definite sources of funding that are critical to working class organizing. And, and without a strong labor movement, um, that really, really makes it so much more difficult for all of the people doing hard work, the necessary work. And, and, and so what I'm saying is um, that there are powerful, powerful economic interests trying to make sure that um, working class people don't come together. Well, so there's something, there's a point I make in the episode, which is that more so than, than most other things, working class movements, working class solidarity mo movements are very vulnerable because of both the economic interests of the people in power and, and because working class people and particularly working class white people are brought into the movements because it can serve, it can help them in their crisis. Um, and the way that they, that they become, you know, that they get longevity is what, is what High said is, is about getting people to commit to values and to commit to values sort of above all else. And so I know that, you know, Stephanie and Kelly are working on this. I know Hai is working on this at, at, at the uh, School for Organizers, at North, North Alabama School for Organizers. And it, but it'd be good to hear about kind of what it takes to, you know, once people come into a movement because they're, they're there for, you know, because they have roaches in their house, how do you get them to, to kind of develop anti-racist consciousness, even if you're starting from the point of, you know, sometimes overt racism? or starting from any other point. You know, how do you get them to really stick around and, and believe in anti-racism as a principle that can carry them forward no matter what people throw at them? Relationships. Yeah, and commonalities. Building it, actual relationships, not seeing yeah. someone as just a fulcrum to make something happen. Mm -hmm. Like building real relationships with the people and then building relationships with each other. I think a lot of times we talk about the strategic ways to do this and the tactical ways to do this. When the truth is like, it's, it's relationships. <laughs> you, you have to build relationships with people. You have to know people. You have to be there when, when, they're, when they're kids having issues in school, when other things are happening, like building a sub support, a new family, a real community that people can be a part of. And I think that is done on a very local level. Thanks. I think you're right. And finding out what the commonalities are, you know, and what you have in common with each other is very important. Um, because if you, as far as uh, racism, you know, the Young Patriots are probably some, one of the most racist organizations at the beginning, but they found account commonalities with Blacks Hispanics, American Indians, and built those relationships that you're talking about. And that's real important. And I think once people start working on those commonalities and those values, I think that's when you, you can have the beginning of a movement, you know? And I agree, relationships are the most important thing. Well then, hi, let me ask you this, because you, meant, you alluded to communications earlier and how that's changed. Mm -hmm. It used to be that you know, to organize, you pretty much had to be face to face at some point. You had to be in the yeah. same room. Now you, we don't have to be in the same room. And I wonder, uh, you know, juxtaposing your experiences in the late 1960s to now, how that's changed. And do you think there are hurdles now to building these relationships that didn't exist, say, 50 years ago? Oh, absolutely. You know, we used to stand around the old mimeograph machine and, you know, and crank it 50 off of one hand and 50 off of the other hand, you know, and, and we'd have to find a telephone booth if we wanted to make a call or if there was a call around. Uh, and so it was extremely difficult, but that's what happened with word of mouth. Uh, but then social media came in, you know, and uh, the cell phone and, and then everybody started getting different opinions about things, you know, and it was so hard. And I, the way that I see today is, is, is the social media. There's so many opinions out there. There's so many 
different uh, uh, ways of doing things and listening to. And I, I think people just become, got complacent and got lazy. And, and one, of the, one of the areas that uh, I wanted to mention was back in the 60s, people could not get credit. Okay? I mean, poor people couldn't get credit anywhere. And so after the Poor People's Campaign, Martin Luther King's uh, Poor People's Campaign, um, the government and industry uh, got, a, got a little smart and said, okay, we're gonna start giving people credit you know and so then people could you know at least buy on credit and get a few things and so now one of the problems for instance the movement of the poor people's campaign uh, that's going on now one of the problems they're having is identifying the poor okay because people don't want to be called poor Okay, because I've had it time after time after time, they'll say, I'm not poor. I got this credit card. I got my I got my flat screen TV. I got my old beater car, you know. Uh, and so therefore I'm not a poor person. But but then if we're gonna try to organize poor people, we have to look at the things that they don't have. You know, they don't have proper representation. They are abused by the police. Uh, they don't have proper health care, you know, and you can you can go on and on. And those are the types of things we need to look at if we're going to try to organize poor people. Because if we're going to organize poor people just on what they have as materials, uh, it ain't going to work. Um, because they got the flat screen TV, they got the laptop, they got, you know, whatever. I mean, they're giving away laptops in schools now to kids. So, uh, you know, so that makes a whole big difference in terms of trying to communicate with people. Communication has changed and it's going to keep changing. Uh, and so I think unless we can, we can look at the causes of, of poor and working class people uh, and stop looking at, you know, and stop looking at them in terms of, what they don't have and start looking at them, looking at the cause of why they don't have it. Uh, then I, I think that's that's the way to build a movement. But I think a lot of times we're going, we're judging in the wrong, wrong way. We're judging in the wrong direction. And another issue in terms of identification, and this actually comes to the reason, you know, my family connection to this topic, which I was talking about before we hopped on the call, which is, you know, my my great grandfather was shooting at union organizers in Alabama in the 30s. The reason being that he or he identified more with being white than he did with being poor. Yeah. And so it was pretty easy to turn him against working class solidarity because he cared more. You know, he cared more about it. He wanted to be like the mill owners. And so they could recruit him to shoot at the at the, at the union organizers in the mills. And so I mean, I'd love love thoughts as well about how I mean, so we've talked about relationship building, but about, you know, how you how you address whiteness in these conversations how you how do you talk to people to poor to poor white people about whiteness in a way that can to, that can get them to, to think about you know not identifying with whiteness to the point at which they'd be willing to die for it yeah <clears throat> yeah um i remember one time talking to uh some people in a bar in, in chicago uh we had our you know Confederate flag on, but with a, a free Huey button on it, a black power button uh, sticking to it. And we'd walk into a bar and it would cause a conversation because of that, uh, that Confederate flag with, you know, black power buttons or whatever. And, um, and I remember talking to a man who was extremely racist, a very, you know, known to be a very white supremacist in the community, Nazi type. And we were talking about racism and he said he would always, you know, he thought that all black people should be hung. Okay, I mean, that, that was still his philosophy. Um, and, and I asked him, I said, do you have children? He said, yes, I do. And I said, well, 
what if that child needed some type of a transplant? Um, you know, organ transplant and needed it. He was on a waiting list and really needed it right away. And the, the only person that could give it to them was a black person. I said, do you feel that you would accept that? And just right away, he said, yes, of course I would. And I said, well, then why are you so damn racist? You know, um, we're all the same on the inside, but you're looking at the skin color and you're looking at what you've been taught, you know, the way you've been raised. You know, so that, that he started thinking about that and that was a whole different story. And then he started cooperating more with us and uh, some of his old cronies did too. So, you know, there's all different types of ways of getting to people. Uh, everybody has needs, but if you know what those needs are and can fulfill those needs, sometimes that helps. And I know I talked to you, Stephanie and Kelly, about how whiteness comes up in your conversations about, you know, who's in the room. And that's actually in the episode. But if you could, if you could kind of get into the, into the ways in which you've talked about the ways, in, in, in the ways in which you talked about how whiteness affects your organizing work and how white people's role in your organizing work is different from that of, of Black neighbors in Shelbyville, for instance, that would be great. Um, well, I um... So something we talk about with people is we want them to recognize why maybe black people, people of color aren't in the room with us because they're afraid because they have more to lose than we do. And um, that's why we put ourselves out there more. That's why, you know, the police are less likely to mess with us. And that's something that we, you know, make sure they know. And a lot of people agree and they're like, yeah, you're, you know, no. I think that's right. I think that, um, like Stephanie mentioned, like talking about who's not in the room and why, there's also like a piece around the, the, the fear issue, which, you know, like when we say, oh, um, I don't want to say, you know, black and brown folks are more scared, but they, there's just more danger. And actually having that discussion of why when we say, oh, you should call a codes officer and report your substandard issue. Um, sometimes like Latino folks and black folks are like, I don't want someone in my house. We, you know, they're, they might be in here looking for things, looking for reasons to call the police on me. Um, and, and that's all real. That's just true. We're more likely to be able to call the police if a landlord do, does something illegal to us and not have to also fear that that policeman is going to react to us because um, of the color of our skin. He's probably gonna be very friendly when he gets there. I mean, not necessarily, cause let's just say police are not friendly to poor, poor folks in general, but they, they are more likely to be aggressive with black folks and with Latino folks. Um, there may be, I don't remember if it's mentioned in the podcast, we talked about, um, centering the needs of the community. So if we are having a strategy conversation about what do we need and we have renters in the room and maybe black and brown folks haven't shown up to that particular meeting, then we wanna be sure if there are black and brown folks who will get on the phone with us, even if they won't come to the meeting, then when we come up with that strategy and that plan, we call those folks and we're like, what do you think of this? How do you, what do you think are the consequences of moving this way? What do you think is gonna happen here? And then having other folks in the movement even if they're not in Shelbyville, black and brown led groups that are politically aligned with us, having conversations about what makes sense. Cause we do have to talk with our members about, so we really like the idea of preemptive code inspections. Well, the more we talk to black and brown groups that do housing around the country and talk to folks there, they were like, hey, wait a minute, maybe we don't want codes showing up when we didn't ask them to and checking out our rental properties. So. The thing is, is to always center the most affected and the group with the, like the most danger. And so we bring up those conversations, we're making decisions. I think that's a mistake. We were talking about mistakes that groups have made in the past doing this work is not looking out to like, oh, we want this, this sounds great, but not stopping and going, 
what are the steps five de- five steps down the road that are going to happen if we start doing this and there, there's like big words for it, like centering people of color leadership or centering you know, like there's words for it. but basically checking in with our folks black and brown renters and being like hey i know you weren't at the meeting but what do you think of these plans and these strategies and the things we're talking about and then talking to white renters who show up about why they're not in the room and bringing up, hey, that's a great idea, but here's some issues with that. And here's some things we've heard. Thanks. I just also wanted to, something that I forgot that um, kind of related to this of why we like point that out too, because here lately with the election, everything's been so heated. Like we actually have like a, like, I guess our arch nemesis group of like patriot right people that are forming and um, that I keep like mentioning like that are gonna work that are organizing people as well. And that's why we have to get to them first. And that's also why we have to protect people because I mean, I have a landlord stalker that (laughs) like looks for me places. Um, There was a guy that um, kept driving by one of our members houses and you know she has a multiracial family um there was a county commissioner that cornered me in a parking lot over an immigrant bill i mean there's just you know reasons to keep folks safe because it's real out there (laughs) i'm I'm wondering we've, we've talked about organizing people and 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 stephanie you've been elected to the city council in Shelbyville, are there things that citizens who want to work together can ask of their city or county, uh, whether it comes from uh, where funds go, um, how to direct uh, resources that could make some some difference, uh, perhaps sooner rather than later? Um, I think there's definitely like things folks should be asking. And I think there's things that like we've been asking before is like right now COVID's going on. Where's the money going? I know they got money to fix up their airport. Um, There were questions. I know some, one of our members brought up to the police department around like, like how is that being handled? Something that, um, so I've not, I haven't been like, official like I'm not officially in the city council yet that happens December 10th but um like right now we're hiring a new city manager and I get to sit on and on those interviews and part of what I'm listening to is like how people respond to questions around the police department and things that you know affect our most affected people here Oh, Michael, were you wanting to, oh, you leaned into the screen, so I didn't want to um, do that. Kelly, anything that you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, I think that's right on. I think Stephanie's new to this, and we're going to find out how to make some changes um, that that could be, yeah, done quicker and better now that, you know, renters and other folks in the community, working people and disabled people are going to have a voice on the city council where they've been ignored before. I mean, some simple asks, like at, we've been asking the county codes department to put the substandard housing codes, just like what are the violations on a website for a year and a half? I mean, the hope is like being on city council, there can be a little extra pressure now um, to get that website up to date. What's the process for reporting a code? I mean, that's like a very simple, tangible ask that would really help people just to know what is a violation and who do I tell? I mean, things as simple as that would start um, moving things in the right direction. I'm sorry, hi. Uh, Yeah, I've always been an advocate for the homeless. And I think these are the people that really get forgotten a lot. And I think they forget, they. They get forgotten when we talk about the working class and the poor, they're definitely poor. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of power within those groups of, of, of homeless people. 
Uh, I know around the country and and in in Huntsville, um, we recognized a need for those people that are living in tents uh, because uh, every time it rained, they get flooded. Uh, and, and so we just, we got a group of people together and formed a coalition uh, called, called the Homeless Construction Coalition. And we went to businesses and got their old pallets, the shipping pallets, and went out to these homeless uh, villages and built these platforms, uh, put plywood on it, put their tents on it, even their pets, you know, we got dog houses for them or, you know, and, and storage for them. And then we started talking about um, why can't homeless people have power, you know? Uh, we understand that there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of mental uh, problems, physical problems. Uh, the cops are always coming in and harassing them or even when they get out. And why can't they band together in some type of an organization? So we do have one here that we got one, we, we got them to elect a mayor of this village. And, and that mayor, you know, is a very intelligent person, you know, that just hard luck, lost their, you know, lost their home. Uh, and then they, we get some of them to go to the city council meeting and say, hey, we're here, we need help, you know? But this is something that we allow them to do and not necessarily try to control what they do. Uh, and so that in itself has been kind of picking up and starting a, a homeless movement here in, in, in Huntsville. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a number of different ways and we're forming relationships with them. We help them get services and all that. And actually I've helped some get apartments and jobs. And so these are, these are groups of people we should never forget because these are groups of people that will show up for us, you know, when we need them to show up. And, uh, you know, so I just wanted, just wanted to put that in there that we should never forget the homeless. And actually, I mean, that it, the same thing has happened in cities across the country. I mean, you know, I, my other job is as a, as a police accountability reporter in Seattle and among the most like prominent voices in the world of police accountability are homeless coalitions, which mm -hmm. are modeling multiracial solidarity in Seattle more so than any almost anyone else. It's coalitions of, of homeless people, which are, you know, by and large in Seattle, about 50% white, 20% native, 20% black, it, you know, it winds up being um, a, yes. a multiracial coalition just necessarily. And then also sex workers um, coalitions that yes. have been modeling multiracial solidarity in ways that very few other groups are. Um, and that's, that's not just, yeah, that's not just true in Seattle. That's gonna be true all over the place. And of course, you know, those are also representing the, the most vulnerable um, of the vulnerable. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if we're looking for models and com you know, models that you can find all over the place, that, that's where those, pl those are places to look. Yeah, and, and in Philadelphia, um, um, the chairman, chairperson of our Young Patriots is a sex worker. You know, she, oh, she goes out on the street and helps the, the homeless, you know, and she does a, a, a lot of good work there. We've got about, I don't know, six or seven minutes left. Uh, I want to remind folks that um, when this is over, you can go to 91.3 or KUAF.com. You can hear this second episode of the podcast. We're going to hear from Michael in the third episode. Isn't that right, Paul? I mean, you're the executive producer. I'm not going to tell you. Right. What to do. Yes, yeah. You um, all right. So this is really unfair, but I'm going to ask each of you to take, I don't know, 90 seconds, because I think one of the things that has to be battled, hi, uh, you've mentioned complacency. Michael, you've laid out some, in places where um, cynicism might take over. How, how do you yourselves or how do you encourage others to battle complacency, to battle cynicism, to battle hopelessness? Again, not fair, 90 seconds each, but, but are there anything that you can do? Michael, you raise your hand. So, so yeah, uh, the, the one thing that 
I want to tell everyone about is um, our living wage campaign here at the University of Arkansas. Um, local 965 first asked me now part of the Arkansas Education Association two years ago launched a, um, a campaign to uh, make sure that every full time employee at the University of Arkansas is making a living wage. And that means if there are two adults and two dependents in a family, each of the adults has to make about $15. And we have the University of Arkansas Chancellor on board with that program right now, and he has uh, created the money. And the, here at the University of Arkansas, as, as you know, Kyle, um, it, it is the, the, the physical plant people, the grounds people, the housekeeping people who are the, the, the most racially, ethnically diverse. And so these movements can improve the lives of people and bring them out of poverty in fundamental ways. Um, and, and so even though I, I am cynical, I, I think that um, these local small scale movements are essential for helping people live better lives. And I, I, I think that's, yeah, I guess that's all, that's my non-cynical response. Mm -hmm. I think a crucial element in, in helping me remain somewhat optimistic is that there is still a possibility of building a I mean, it, it was actually gestured to in the notion of building relationships, of building some sort of cultural identity around around working class identity, things that that, you know, that give people the warm and fuzzies. So in conversations with Stephanie and Kelly, we, you know, things like Dolly Parton came up. Um, <laughs> there are also things like, you know, I know that Hank hey, Willie Hart. Village was one of the was one of the proposals of the, of, of the Young Patriots, giving, giving giving people something that makes them feel tied to working class identity and that gives them something cultural and warm and fuzzy to then tie to anti-racism as well and to tie to a vision of a better future that you know a, a culture they can carry with them into the future as as working class people working towards anti-racism uh it's doable and you know the fact that someone like dolly parton comes out you know supportive of black lives matter it, it means a lot because it gives something people it gives people something to hold on to that that'll last beyond uh, you know, unpleasant, that, that'll carry them through unpleasant interactions with the police or unpleasant interactions with the landlord or things like that. You know, it, it, people need warm and fuzzies in movement organizing to keep, you know, to keep going. Stephanie, you have to like, you have to like organize people in hope. You tell people to dream big. You can't organize people in fear because they'll be afraid and they won't keep joining you. We ask people like, what do you want? What does Shelbyville look like if we all stick together and we fight our landlords? Do we own our own apartment buildings? Do we, can we sleep at night because we don't have bugs crawling all over us? Can we sleep at night because we're not afraid of falling through our houses? Do we have like heat and air now? You know, these are things that we tell people to dream big and that's what we're working for. We're, that's just, this is what we have to do. Or people won't stick with it. People don't wanna, organize things that are scary because <laughs> their their lives are already scary they're already going through a lot they don't want more scary <laughs> they want you know drink like you said warm and fuzzy <laughs> well thank you all so much paul hi and and hi's book revolutionary hillbilly is out next month you can look for that paul the third episode of the podcast will come out soon. The second one has just come out. You can hear it here in just a moment on 91.3 KUAF or KUAF.com. It'll also be at KUAF.com later. Uh, thanks everyone for being with us. Stephanie, Kelly, thank you so much. Tell everyone in uh, Shelbyville we said hello. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, this has been recorded, so you'll be able to go to Fayla.org, see it again, and share it. The next one of these conversations is January 28th. 2021. We look forward to everyone coming back. Paul, we got 60 seconds. What can we expect in, in episode three? Well, we're thinking about the election. Everyone's still thinking about the election because it drags on forever. So the question is, do does the ballot box actually bring about anti-racist change? Is the ballot box an effective tool for anti-racist change? And has 
has you know quote unquote southern liberalism the the bill clintons and the and the al gores of, of history actually been representative of of anti-racist change or, or is there another way for the ballot to actually bring about a future that we'd be that we would find uh, amenable if we are anti-racist so that's what we're looking at all right paul so, hi michael stephanie kelly thank you so much Corey at fayetteville public library and everyone at fpl thank you so much lee wood thank you so much all of you who joined us thank you so much we'll see you on the 28th good night everybody thank you kyle paul everyone else thank you Adios. Bye-bye.